We have two guest speakers today. It's a, sort of a, a fascinating uh, series of discussions and irrational for uh, their being here. The, the focus of the discussion is going to be about uh, safety in the operating room, particularly with electrosurgical devices. So that's going to be the, the kind of overall guiding theme. But we have two remarkable speakers with us. Uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Paul Fuschenberg, uh is first uh, 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 the senior speaker that's with us. As you'll see quickly from his accent, he was born in Paris, lived in France and Germany before moving to the United States in 1987. Uh, he's got a whole series of backgrounds of training, becoming a surgical oncologist, essentially with the Roswell Park Institute in New York, and then joined Kaiser Permanente Group here in Northern California, where he headed up their hepatobiliary surgery group. Uh, but he currently uh, has worked with the American College of Surgeons on patient safety issues uh, and heads up the Northern California, the interregional Kaiser uh, ACS NISQIP initiative or dealing with the patient safety for 21 hospitals in Northern California. He's joined by a, essentially a surgery chief resident uh, from McGill University. Uh, Dr. Amin Madani was also born in Paris, uh, France, and immigrated to Toronto, Canada in 1991. He's got his undergraduate degree from University of Toronto and a medical degree from Western University in Canada and then a surgical training at McGill. He, he's been a large advocate with SAGES working on the development of the FUSE program uh, and is really one of the, one of the linchpins of putting together the safety program. So please welcome our two guest speakers for this morning's presentation. Thank you very much. I'm Pascal Fuchsuber. Um, we're going to split this up. I'm going to give you a little bit of an introduction into electrosurgical safety, and then Dr. Madani will go to the details, the things that when I started thinking about this, I had no idea about it. So we were basically, uh, five years ago, a group of uh, people at SAGES got together and realized that most surgeons don't know that they don't know anything about electrosurgical safety and how it works. So let me start off by, and, and this, is not, this is not a competition thing, I'm just going to be curious because I was in your shoes five years ago. Who knows how a, we still call it Bovi cautery device works? Who, who would be able to explain it to me today now? Great. So I see at least a few hands. I'm going to ask that question again after the end, <laughs> after the, what we talked about. Here's another uh, little scenario question. You are an attending surgeon, there's some bleeding in the retroperitoneum. You grab um, regular forceps, you know, the cheapest bipolar device we have. You grab the vessel, you grab the vessel, and then you ask the resident to hit you, right? So um, what setting is your ESU on when you ask the resident? What would you like that setting to be when you hit that um, forceps to, to coagulate the vessel? Cutting. Cutting? Who said that? Who would have said cutting other than him? Okay, who would have said coag? And, and the vast majority wouldn't even do it? Come on, guys. Raise your hand. Who would have said coag? All right, the majority. Okay, so I'm going to ask again, okay, about this question. Don't be afraid. I'm, I'm just, I'm not an academic surgeon. I can't influence your career. I'm just, I'm not going to sit on any board to make sure. So here's our disclosures. These are all unrestricted grants to the foundation. This is how it works at Sages. So here you are. Why do we have a program to teach it? Do you consider yourself an expert? We already touched on that. I know uh, you probably inside yourself can answer that answer, that question. Can you assemble your favorite device? Or do you rely on the nurses and the technicians to do it? Ask yourself that. Would you be able to do this without any help? Have you ever seen an injury from an uh, energy device in the operating room? As little as a burn on the skin that should have not happened. Who has not? Right. Good. Honest group this morning. Thank you. <laughs> you know, we, we lie seven times a day, the psychologists say, so remember that. Have you ever used an energy device without prior training and reading the package insert? Who has ever used one reading the package insert, right? <laughs> Okay, we're all on the same boat. And so I'm going to show you a video, and you're going to laugh. But then at the end, you may not laugh so much. This is actually from the Nick series. Everybody, anybody knows about the Nick series? Great. You should all watch it. It's the best medicine uh, 
um, movie on on the, on Netflix or on the on the on the web. So what you're going to see is you're going to see the first you're going to see the original first Bowie machine that was made, and they did a very good job in this because they had very good medical historical assistance. They actually got this out of the museum and used it in the film. You're going to see an energy device injury in the operating room, and you're going to see a death. Wouldn't be Hollywood if there wasn't somebody dying, right? So let's look at that. Can we turn the light down? No. Some chuckles there. Good. I told you you're going to laugh. Turn it on a little bit. Yeah, that was great, wasn't it? <laughs> so, what if I told you, now you're not going to laugh, that the last nurse that died in the operating room from an electrosurgical uh, injury was in 1974? That's when we stopped using ground-based devices, where the operating room table would be the ground for your electrosurgical device. So if there was a short circuit, you got <laughs> electrocuted. Now, she got electrocuted. It's a little bit. She got electrocuted because the whole system went back to 50 hertz current out of the. She wouldn't have been electrocuted if the end device that she put the water on was still working as it was designed. Right? Because otherwise the patient would have been electrocuted, right? So think about it. Why is it that we are using like electros, electrical energy? And I tell you, up to 9,000 volt comes out of that SU, ESU. Why do we don't die? Hold that thought, because we'll explain to you if you didn't know why. So this is the modern version of that same video by, brought out by the um, Anesthesia Foundation on ORFIs. And I'm just going to show you, because this is 100 years later, right? Not very different, except nobody does. Fire! Fire! So this is also an electrosurgical injury because the fire was through sparking, right? By using the electrosurgical device. And this is what happens. 20% of those fires have permanent injury or death. And it's usually young people undergoing totally elective procedures in the head and neck. And these are totally preventable. If we understood how these devices work, this would not happen. This should not happen. So again, the anesthesiologists are way ahead of us. We're the last one coming into this field and trying to understand this. Like in many other ways for system errors, the surgeons are the last one on the table. 103 closed claims, 90% um, electrosurgical causes, 85% head and neck, 84% through open oxygen source, 20% permanent disability or death. So. What happened 100 years ago? Bovey, William T. Bovey, invented a way to use electrical energy or current to get the tissue effect that was obtained 3,000 years before that by the hot poker. What is that? Cautery. And when he started, and when you look at the open Bovey electro cautery device, it's that small little piece of metal, right, at the end of a long line at where the energy comes. Now, if I tell you that when you do that with the kind of current that we use, and Dr. Madani will go into that, you create an electromagnetic field around that piece of metal. 
What has changed? Look at this. This is what we used to use, and this is what we use now, right? For 90% of what we do. What is this? This is a long insulated conductor. This is an antenna. If I put 3,000 volts of the current that we use for the Bovi through this, I get a huge electromagnetic field. If I take another one of these, there's the energy, and this one doesn't have the energy, the energy from this jumps to the other one. And if it's parallel, it's perfectly tuned. It's like when, on the old days on the TV, when you changed the, the way the antenna was set, you tune it. So when we do same, when we do single hole surgery, we set ourselves up for the perfect storm of getting energy of the activated device that you pay great attention to, that it doesn't touch anything else, to the one that's holding the bow. We'll come back to that. Just implanting a little thing in your... So here's a guy that really is very famous and has a lot of resources. And I didn't want to be the physician in the room, but he had, he's a senator who died from a s simple elective laparoscopic cholecystectomy because he had a hole in the bowel that was not recognized and died of sepsis seven days later. This is the same patient, seven operations between this picture and this picture. GYN procedure, hole in the sigmoid colon, okay? Unrecognized, survived. There's two million, two to three million laparoscopic procedures in the United States. And the estimate is that one in a thousand. One in a thousand means it takes you three years as a single surgeon, three to four years to see one. So you don't know about it. Oh, this was just an unfortunate complication, hold the bowel, don't know how it happened. Next, because it takes another three years. But when you look at those numbers, that's 40,000 injuries a, a year. That's part of the problem why we don't, it doesn't, and it takes a lot of time to repeat this until it really sinks in for the pediatric surgeons in the room. What happened here? Wrong size pad. No, uh, say it again. Wrong size pad. Yeah, well, not wrong size pad, maybe, but the pad was not applied or it was moist. And what the energy that you put at your effector device, the 100 watts, right? They're very specifically at the end of a little metal rod. The same energy goes to the pad. The pad is large because it disperses the energy so there's no heating on the skin. Otherwise, you would have the same. T if you put a little piece of metal there and connect it to the returning pad outlet in your ESU, you get a burn there. The same burn you get where you put your Bowie device. So this is a third degree burn from a return pad that was applied wrong. But it doesn't have to be a hole, it doesn't have to be a death, it doesn't have to be sepsis. This is a case where there was a hole in the intestine, but this is what the rest of the intestine looked like. This is like driving your Ferrari 100 times around the same corner trying to go faster and faster, and eventually you're gonna run out and hit the tree. But all the other times, you almost hit the tree. These are energy burns, device burns, on the serosa that maybe brought the patient back for pain into the ear but didn't cause any damage. What I'm trying to illustrate here, it's much more common than you think that this happens. So this is somebody that actually put it together, looked at all the laparoscopic bowel injury cases that were published. Not that many, but 329,000 procedures and 450 bowel injuries total, okay? A third of these were from electrosurgical injuries. Look at the mortality rate. If it's an unrecognized injury, which is what I showed you, it's a, almost 8%. What's the mortality rate for an elective colon in this country? 2%, thank you very much. You knew that, Ben. You're a star. And even for the recognized one, even if you see it and it happens, Still 3%, right? Since I'm from Kaiser and you know Kaiser, I'm going to show you this. Just read it. It's an email from the chief of cardiovascular surgery 
in Kaiser Sunset down in L.A. And they, <laughs> I like the verbiage. Recent flame-ups. <laughs> All the sparking. It was sparky last year. <laughs> so this is a surgeon that recognizes that he doesn't know it. So he knows he doesn't know it. Most of us don't even know we don't know it, which is why we're here. How much more time do, I, do we have? Why fuse? So again, I'm just going to repeat myself, but look at the last line here. That should be about a billion today. Right? This is in 1999 dollars. So <laughs> even at Sages, where we did this, the big guys, you know, the top said, ah, this is all crap. You know, of course, it doesn't happen to me. Why do we do this? You know, so we did it. <laughs> we went to the board and said, hey, guys, we're going to do a little exam with you guys. And this is how they did. 59% got it right. And these are all the top leaders of surgery in the country in general surgery. <laughs> 39, uh, 30, uh, one in three did not know how to handle fire. One in 10 didn't know that there was a thermal imprint. And one in 10 would have cut a dispersive electrode in a child. And I just showed you a picture of what happened. So we thought we are onto something. And then we did the same thing in Japan with the same results. And when you think about it, yeah, how is it? at least when I grew up, the rep would come in, ticket for the, for the next Broadway show, and say, here's a new device. You would already be working on the patient. And he said, you know, it's very easy. Let's try this. You just hit the red button for this and the green button for that, and you would do it, right? And even today, do you really understand what they bring in the war for you? And then you, tr you try it, right? And it works or it not. Does the patient consent? He's asleep. She's asleep. It's like going on a plane ride from New York to Paris, and the guy, the pilot, comes on to the PA and says, you know, I've never flown this fl uh, thing before, but all the instruments look the same. You know, I think I can do it. <laughs> really. So let's face it. After what I told you, would you still go under, knowing that the surgeon doesn't know what he's using? and how it works. So that's why we have FUSE, Fundamental Use of Surgical Energy. It's a free learning program on the internet. And I'll t t tell you at the end of the meeting how to get onto it. We have a book. We have um, the curriculum online, 240 slides, 12 hours of CME if you want to pay 60 bucks to Sages. And then you can get, actually, a validated MOC-ready exam. And let me tell you, Within the next 10 years, the board is going to mandate that. If not the board, then the AHA, American Hospital Association. It's going to come, because we can't live with these injuries any longer. These are the 10 chapters. And it's all safety in the OR. Let me just run one more thing, Amin, and then it's you. This is one of the slides from the curriculum. In an electrosurgical setting, the three factors that must combine in order to generate a fire are spark, fuel source, and an oxidizer. This animation is a demonstration of a facial burn that occurred during a local anesthesia procedure on the face. Factors illustrated in this animation that promote fire risk are the closed tent effect of the large drapes creating an oxygen-rich environment about the patient's face an opportunity for the oxygen to leak out under surgical field drain. The use of the higher voltage coagulation mode instead of cutting mode during coaptive coagulation of the vessel bleeding in the field. An unnecessarily high power setting on the ESU. Activating the ESU prior to touching the forceps which created a spark. All of these factors can be minimized or eliminated in order to create a safer surgical environment. All members of the surgical team must remain vigilant to identify factors that contribute to the risk of surgical fire and be empowered to correct them. So remember this, open activation, energy setting on the ESU, and um, creating, uh, using the right 
energy for the tissue effect that you want. And with that, I'm going to have Dr. Madani go into the nits and grits. Hopefully, you'll get hooked on this like I was the first time I heard about it. Thank you, Dr. Madani. This is a resident. Good morning. Thank you for that introduction. Can you guys hear me at the back OK? That's uh, not causing too much feedback. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, I got involved with this as a resident and uh, you know, during my research years, it was pretty cool. And for those residents out there, it is a very easy curriculum to go through online. There's very nice audio, visual uh, animations. It's, uh, you know, at McGill and most of the Canadian universities, we now mandate that all new incoming surgical residents have to go through the curriculum. It takes like three hours and it's very, very high yield. So we're just gonna give you a taste of that. For those of you who are thinking of doing the certification exam, this is like the, um, the lion's share of the curricular content. Uh, so just to give you an idea of that. So let's talk about radiofrequency electrosurgery. Um, you know, we talk about cautery a lot, but it's really radiofrequency electrosurgery. And what does it do? Every time we take that, uh, that bovi pen, we apply it to the tissue, what actually happens? So we apply alternating current to the tissues, and what it does is creates a polarity across the cells, a positive and negative. And that draws the ions inside the cells to different ends of the cell. And because it's alternating current, that oscillates at very high frequencies. So the, cell, the ions inside the cells also move it really quickly. And it's thought that it's that frictional force uh, that raises the temperature of the cells in the end. So this type of here's a video to demonstrate the cell, that. The alternating polarity causes those ions to rapidly oscillate back and forth inside the cell, including some large proteins. This process results in frictional forces that are responsible for elevating the cellular temperature. And so that, in the end, results in the tissue effects that we see, uh, such as vaporization of the cells, desiccation, and so on. And we'll talk about that right now. Um, just a uh, disclosure, I guess I'm Canadian, so we use uh, degrees Celsius, not Fahrenheit. I apologize for that. Uh, you know, just as a reference, 100 degrees is when water boils. <laughs> so <laughs> I don't know. It's maybe not a common thing. So. <laughs> When, what happens when we raise this, the temperature of the cell? We go to 50 to 60 degrees Celsius. You get sort of uh, cell death over a few minutes. Um, and then when you go above that, so 60 to 90 degrees is an important temperature range. So two things happen. The cell, uh, first of all, dehydrates. Okay, the membrane of the cell starts to break down. It becomes permeable. And, uh, and you also get uh, uh, denaturation of the proteins. Um, but then when it cools down, it reforms, but in kind of a haphazard manner. So this is called tissue desiccation, okay? And, uh, and you kind of notice that with that white thing when you buzz tissue, um, it's called desiccated tissue. And it's an insulator, it doesn't actually conduct electricity. Now what happens when we go above that? 100 degrees Celsius, water vaporizes. You actually, the cell blows up and you get uh, what's called vaporization of the tissue. And you can even go above 100 degrees Celsius. You can go very like 200, 300, 400. And what happens is you actually break down the organic material into elemental sugars, so you get caramel forming. It's called caramelization, literally. And you notice that when you have sticky stuff to uh, attach to your instruments. Um, and you can also break down uh, organic material into elemental carbon, so you get sort of that, that black hue that forms on the tissue when you at very high voltages. Notice I haven't said cautery yet, okay? And we, yet we use that term all the time. Uh, Electrocautery, um, you know, it's a very common term. But to what is cautery? Cautery is actually the passive transfer of heat. So if I was to take a flame and heat my finger, that would be me cauterizing it. N not for any particular good reason. Um, we talked about pokers. Uh, hot, that this is how they did it in medieval times. Or, you know, when you see Braveheart or whatever movie in Hollywood, they take a hot poker and they stop the bleeding. That's true cautery. But we use electrosurgery, which is very different. So, what is so? How, so, what's the difference between monopolar and bipolar instruments? And the truth is, every radio frequency uh, device is bipolar. There's there's actually not a true monopolar device. Um, everything's bipolar. There's always two electrodes. The only difference is what's the use and function of that second electrode. So we'll demonstrate right, that right here. Here we have a uh, electrosurgical unit, a generator. Okay, and it's attached to the to the patient. Okay, well, we first demonstrate monopolar devices. So this is the little tip, okay, the active electrode, that's the term. 
and uh, that's one electrode. And the second electrode is this pad, and we always call it grounding pad, but that's actually a misnomer. We never ground patients. We actually have a closed circuit. And so both of these have wires that go back to the ESU, and then that's your closed circuit, and you have alternating current going through this. And then when you activate it, you send the current that goes through the body of the patient. Okay. Now contrast this to bipolar instruments. Um, you have, again, two electrodes, but the difference here is the two electrodes are in the device itself. And when you activate that, the current is sort of limited to, um, to this path right here. Um, so you can see how bipolar instruments can be a, a lot safer because you don't actually have current going through the body of the patient going to other places. It's kind of restricted to this area. Now, does that mean bipolar instruments are the answer? No, we know mon monopolar is very uh, versatile and, and we can use it for a variety of things. But the idea is to just understand how this works so you can minimize the, uh, the, the, uh, the adverse events that can work. So what is this machine that we have in UOR, this electrosurgical unit with the no numbers and the knobs? Uh, it actually does a few functions. First of all, it converts the frequency from the wall output from 60 hertz to uh, over 100,000 hertz. Uh, and the reason because is, have you ever wondered why you don't electrocute your patients every time you use that? Is because you, you, that high frequency bypasses the uh, nerves and the muscle's ability to depolarize. Uh, so that way you don't electrocute people when you use it. And also you want that very high frequency because that high frequency is what causes that thermal effect that you want uh, when the ions move back and forth. So that's number one. The second thing is it adjusts the power. Okay, so whenever you say, you ask the nurse, can you put it on coax 30? That 30 is the amount of power, the amount of joules per, uh, per second, the amount of energy per unit time that del you're delivering through your circuit. Now notice you can give coax 30 cut 30. It's, it's the same amount of power, okay? The third thing is you adjust something called the duty cycle, which I'll explain in a second. That's the difference between cut and coag. Does anybody care to maybe describe what the difference between cut and coag is? I think I saw a few hands. Go ahead. Uh, the uh, coag is uh, an interrupted intermittent current, and the cut is continuous at 500. They're both at 500,000 hertz, but uh, in the case of coag, uh, periodically interrupted. That's absolutely correct. So essentially the energy is spread through time versus concentrated, and I'll demonstrate that in this next slide. So here you have a circuit shown, and we've attached it uh, to a schematic oscillator, uh, oscilloscope I mean, and the oscilloscope will demonstrate the current and the voltage that goes through your circuit. So you ask the nurse to put it on cut for you, put it on cut 30, because that's the number we usually do, and then you activate your device. And so this is the kind of current that goes through your system. Uh, through your circuit. So you have a sine wave here. It's alternating current, so it goes back and forth, and it's continuous waveform, like you said. All that 30 joules per second is spread through time. So it's relatively, you see the amplitude is, is relatively lower. So it's relatively lower voltage cut. On the other hand, and when you go higher, okay, you ask for 100 cut, it's the same waveform, okay, but it's a higher amplitude, so higher voltage because you've gone up on, on, the, on the power. And if you go back to 30, you get this. So continuous uh, waveform and relatively lower voltage. Now let's contrast this to coag. You ask for 30 coag. Again, it's 30. It's the same amount of energy per unit time. But it's now, all that energy is concentrated on these intermittent bursts of high voltage current. OK, so current doesn't go 100% of the time through the circuit. It only comes at 6% uh, of the time. So the duty cycle is 6%. Okay. And because of that, it's interrupted, it's higher, much higher voltage, and it's a lower duty cycle. Now, you, know, you might say, like, who cares? Why, why do I need to care about a duty cycle and voltages? What does it mean for me as a surgeon? And it actually has very, a lot of implications. It can, and we'll talk about some of these. But it can be anything from high voltage can cause a lot of collateral thermal spread. It can cause a lot of different injuries. Higher voltage can interfere with pacemakers a lot more and uh, implantable devices. So, so there's a lot of different things that can happen when you use higher voltage. What about blend? We have that function as well on the ESUs. Um, what does that mean? It's cut plus coag. Uh, so basically, you use blend when you press the cut button, um, and, but you have to ask the, the, the float nurse to actually put it on blend on the device. 
and when you put it on 30, you get something in between. So basically, duty cycle is a spectrum. On one end of the spectrum, you have 100%, which is cut. On the other hand of the spectrum, you have 6%, which is coag, and you have in-between settings as well, which is where blend comes in. Okay, So you have a 50% duty cycle for that. Something that's really important and took a while for me to figure out is, and this is one of the biggest problems and misconceptions, is that handheld device, you have cut and you have coag. And the idea is, well, cut button is used to cut, and coag is used to coag tissues. But that's 150% wrong. Um, we actually use coag to cut quite a lot, actually. Every time you dissect through planes, you're using coag, you're cutting tissue. So, so that's, that terminology should be kind of thrown out the window. But essentially, we cut tissues. You can cut tissues in dif different variety of ways. And the only difference is um, the amount of collateral thermal injury that you cause. So this is kind of a schematic across section. This is a tissue that you, you bust. So you apply your active electrode here. Okay, You're using cut, so low voltage. The tissue that it comes into contact with, you raise the temperature to above 100 degrees Celsius. So it vaporizes, and you get that cutting effect. Okay, But because it's low voltage, the surrounding tissue doesn't really experience a rise in temperature. So it doesn't really get desiccated. On the other hand of the spectrum, you have coag. So you use high voltage. Not only the tissue that you touch vaporizes, so you get that cutting effect, but the surrounding tissue also experiences a rise in temperature in that 60 to 90 degrees range that I told you about earlier. So you get some desiccation in the surrounding tissue. Okay, cross section would look something like this. This is a piece of steak, by the way. Uh, not a patient tissue. Um, I do want to demonstrate something, though, that you know, the, a lot of questions sometimes come out and people say, well, what's the right setting to use? Do I need to use cut all the time? And no, that's not the message here. The message is use, really take ownership and understand how this works so that you can use the settings, uh, cater it to that situation that you're in. So you know, ideally, you would use, uh, you know, you would use cut if you're dissecting tissue and you're just a very critical structures that surround you. For instance, like let's say you're doing a really difficult gallbladder and the CBD is very close, the duodenum is very close. You don't want a lot of collateral thermal spread. That's what's going to get you into trouble. So maybe then you can decrease the power or use something else like blend or cut. Um, whereas if you're dissecting through tissue where you want that collateral th thermal spread, uh, like let's say you're dissecting through muscle, you're going to get into a lot of bleeding. So coag is actually pretty useful to use in that setting. So you have to kind of understand what scenario to use it. Or when, when in, for instance, if you're cutting skin, you don't want to use coag because that collateral thermal spread will really damage the tissue and you, you'll get a, a poor wound healing. So you want to use cut in that scenario. Another very important principle is current density. The amount of thermal effect you get when you apply current is directly uh, proportional to the, uh, to the current density, the square of current density, actually. And that, that what current density is, the amount of current that goes through your circuit divided by the surface area through which uh, that current is traveling. Okay, So the more dense that current <laughs> is, the more thermal effect you get. Whereas if it's less dense or a broad surface area through which that current travels, like the dispersive electrode, the lower the thermal effect. Okay, and this can be demonstrated here with this uh, monopolar device. So as you know, you can use the tip of it or you can use the flat part. The flat part, you're, you'll get a lower density um, and so you'll get a lower thermal effect. And this can be demonstrated in this video here. So you can see they're using, they're going to use the flat part and it's a larger surface area. So it only raises the temperature to that 60, 90 degrees zone enough to desiccate it. So more for hemostasis. Whereas if they use the tip, it's more concentrated. So you get more thermal effect above 100 degrees Celsius and you get more of a cutting effect. So this is an example of how you, know, you don't need to keep cranking up the voltage, the, the power on the ESU every time to get the thermal effect you want. Sometimes you can use the instrument uh, in a different way to get uh, the intended tissue effect. This is a video uh, that sort of demonstrate this. This is sausage. Um, <laughs> you've got your closed circuit here. Um, this is your active electrode, your dispersive electrode. And then you've got, this is, let's say, the body of the patient. <laughs> okay, and the current travels in this sort of manner here. And, and I want you to watch this very carefully. So they're activating, activating. Okay, so what happened here? So <laughs> current is traveling through that circuit, 
okay? It, they're activating it here, but because it's traveling through the whole sausage, it becomes very concentrated in this little area here. And that's where the thermal effect will be maximum. And that's where you're going to get a big tissue effect. So imagine you're using a monopolar device somewhere, and it gets diverted somewhere else, where you ha manage to just touch you know, skin or bowel or something else, and you can get a thermal effect there without even you noticing in your surgical field. Okay, so the concept of current density is, is very critical to radiofrequency energy. Dr. Fuchsia, we talked about uh, you have a bleeder, you pick it up, and then you say, buzz me. And everybody uses coag because it just feels right. It's very, you know, really gives you that thermal effect that you want. Whereas, in fact, cut is the right answer. Why is that? So it comes back again to those implications of higher voltage. When you buzz, when you buzz, and you're using very hot, hot voltage, what it does is it burns the superficial tissue. Okay, but that desiccated tissue is now an insulator. So it, it, current doesn't go to the deeper tissues. So you get this very heterogeneous uh, sealing effect, essentially. Whereas when you use cut, it's lower voltage, so it takes a little bit more time, but it'll give you a more full thickness uh, burn. Okay, it's like putting a steak in a pan. If it's very, very hot, it'll really fry, like cook the superficial part of the steak, but the deeper steak, I guess, will be very raw. Whereas if you put it on a lower temperature pan, it takes a bit longer, but it'll give you more thick full thickness cook. And so, so that's, that's why. So this is cut, you get a more full thickness seal. Whereas if you use coag, you get more of a heterogeneous thing. And remember when I told you you got caramelization? So that sticky stuff on your tissue, when you release it, it kind of undoes your, your seal as well. So that's another reason why coag is not as good. And in fact, those bipolar sealing devices like Ligature, those are designed for hemostasis. They actually use cut as a setting, a, a continuous waveform. Okay. Um, so what kind of injuries can occur in the operating room related to this? Uh, there's a variety of different things that can occur. I'm not going to go through all of them because it's a little bit, uh, it'll be too long, but uh, I'll just kind of mention a few of the important ones. And I think this kind of goes, when I, st when I was first given an instrument laparoscopy, I always thought that, okay, you know, focus, keep that metal tip in the screen view, don't touch anything else and you will be fine. You're never going to cause an injury. And that's, that's, that's completely wrong. You can cause all sorts of injuries outside your, your field of view on your, where your camera is showing you without you even noticing. And these are shown here. You have direct coupling injury. So that's when metal touches metal and you get current diversion that way. Uh, every time we pick up a vessel and someone says buzz me, that's direct coupling. But sometimes it can be done uh, inadvertently. So let's say, for instance, you touch the, the camera, for instance, or some kind of instrument and you divert current. Another one is uh, insulation failure. And insulation failure, obviously we're using long uh, instruments that are insulated. We assume that it's fully insulated, but oftentimes it's not. Um, and actually there's good evidence that even new uh, instruments that you take out of the package have breaks in insulation. And, uh, and this can leak current outside your field of view. And in fact, it's those very small breaks in insulation that are the most problematic, the ones that are not visible to naked eye. Uh, those are the ones that are problematic because that's where current is very concentrated in a very small surface area. And that's what's gonna get you out of the, uh, out of, into trouble. This is an example that you have your camera here, you have a break in insulation, and uh, you get a burn in the bell without you noticing. Um, another form of direct coupling um, that can cause injury is metal-to-metal -metal arcing. Um, one of the things that I've noticed throughout my training was that every time there's you know, you fire staple line and then there's a little bleeding on the staple line and then they say, okay, just buzz it, just very carefully buzz that thing. And you can actually um, melt the metal when you do that. So you can be demonstrated here in this video. Obviously, you're not going to hold it for that long on the staple line, but it's the principle behind that matters. So what happens is two things. The metal is a great conductor, so all that current is going to be concentrated, and the staple is a very, very small surface area. So you can actually reach temperatures above 1,000 degrees Celsius, and it'll melt the metal. So just be careful. You obviously don't want that on your staple line. Um, capacitive coupling. 
This is not very intuitive at all. And it's like Dr. P. Schubert said, two antennas working together. So, okay, you have two conductors. They're side by side, okay? They're, they're separated, they're not touching, okay? But you have like an insulator or they're separated by air. One of those, condu one of those conductors has uh, alternating current going back and forth in it, okay? And it creates this electromagnetic field, okay? You gotta use your imagination here. It creates some kind of electromagnetic field and just because there's an electromagnetic field, you have another conductor that's close enough, it'll induce a new current in that second conductor that doesn't have any alternating current going through it, okay? And you have a new current now in the non-active conductor. And that current can then go off and do all sorts of things. So imagine here, for instance, you have an insulated instrument, there's current going through the core of it, it creates an electromagnetic field, and it induces a current in that metal trocar. Okay, and you can see what kind of injuries you can cause. Okay, so it barely touches where the current density is high, and that's what can cause it burns happening. Now, most of the time, this goes through the abdominal wall, so that current sort of becomes de uh, dissipated through a large surface area, and you don't notice uh, uh, any injuries. Um, now, if you use plastic or hybrid trocars, that's when it can cause problems. But the principle is also true if you have like a camera or some kind of other conductor. And this is another way to demonstrate that. Um, we do these demonstrations, um, you know, in, in our hand-on uh, workshop. But basically, here you have a conductor, you have a piece of ham hanging over it. Okay, <laughs> We get very creative with these. So let's say you have like a fully insulated instrument. This has been checked, you know. There's no breaks in insulation, I promise you. And you have a piece of ham just hanging over top of it. Okay, you activate this, and this we actually demonstrate this to our, our interns and our residents. So you have an electromagnetic field created. It induces a new current in this piece of ham, and then it barely touches this tissue, and that, that completes the circuit. And, and you get a thermal effect completely outside your field of view. Okay. I'm not making this stuff up. Okay. Scary. What about this? How many times have you guys seen this happening? You see it quite a lot, right? Most of the time you get away with it, but the same principle, again, you have a fully insulated cord with alternating current, induces a new current in this hemostat, and then if it barely touches the skin, even though you have a drape, it'll burn through the drape and it could cause a burn that way. Um, this, uh, these are our colleagues in Argentina who uh, made the, this very interesting video. But essentially, they took this setup and they activated it. So when they approach it, as they barely touch the tissue, you get that current density that you want to cause a burn in, the, in this. There's also a really nice uh, chapter in the uh, FUSE curriculum uh, that uh, is beyond the scope of this talk, but it talks about interference with implantable devices like pacemaker, uh, defibrillators, and essentially it's like, a, again, it's an antenna. So you're, you're creating electromagnetic interference that, um, that interferes with your uh, implantable device. And this can cause all sorts of things. It can cause arrhythmias. It can, uh, it, it can really uh, uh, interfere with the function of the device. Um, the other thing it can do is it can induce a current in the leads here and cause thermal effect at the tissue lead interface. Uh, again, demonstrated by this video here. So this is a thermal camera. They've activated it. Um, they're activating a, a device down here, a monopolar device, and it induces a current in this wire and at the tip that, has, that is not insulated, you can see a thermal effect is just going up. Uh, you're reaching temperatures to even above 50 degrees. Uh, which can cause cell death. And they remove this here. You can see that you've caused a burn injury. Okay? You can minimize this in the OR. If your patient has a pacemaker or implantable device, you can use ultrasonic devices. Those don't cause any interference. You can use low voltage settings. You can use, um, you can use low power. Don't put it all the way to 50 uh, coag every time. Try to minimize that. Try to keep the path of the current away from the pacemakers. So there's a variety of different tricks to get away with it. And really uh, owning these instruments can, can make you safer in the operating room. 
with that, I'll give it back to Dr. Fuschiver, who will close up the session. So um, thank you for uh, enduring us five minutes over time. Really quickly, so this is the uh, uh, entrance page or the opening page on the internet when you go to Fuse Program, www.fuseprogram.org, and then you hit didactic content, and this will um, get you on the page where the Fuse curriculum is. Uh, if some modern people have, uh, can, can uh, use this with the cell phone and copy that and, and go right into it. You just have a small demographic uh, one page um, thing to fill out and then you create your password and you, you're in. And um, it takes about five, four or five hours to go through the curriculum and everything that we talked about is in there plus, okay? There, um, just to say that there are actually now modern technologies that try to go away or circumvent the problem of electromagnetic, which Bovey never thought of because he didn't see this. There are companies now that make these insulated just like your TV cable, because the reason the TV cable has two insulation is that the electromagnetic field doesn't get, doesn't get, comes out. So these are double insulated. I'm going to pull them around. I, I removed the, um, the name of the company. So this, there are companies now that make these devices so they can't form an electromagnetic field. And then there's now the true cautery is coming back. What we use for 3,000 years, now the companies are making actually true cautery end effect tissue devices. Watch, go next time you go to ACS, find them. There's at least two or three out there. Because people are realizing what's happening with what T. Bovey and Irby in Germany independently made this huge jump for us, making all the modern surgery um, possible. I'm not putting them down, I'm just saying. It's only because we're doing MIS for 20 years now that we realize that that type of energy may not be the best energy for what we do, or we need to at least understand it. I hope uh, you guys enjoyed this. I hope that you're all gonna do the FUSE curriculum, and I hope that one day we might have even have a FUSE test center in Sacramento. So thank you very much for your attention. <laughs> Excellent. We do have uh, five minutes for uh, uh, conversations, but uh, first I want to ask Dr. Galante and us out here. Joe, uh, comments on the residency training program and the FUSE program and electrosurgical safety? Yeah, so uh, having an understanding of everything between uh, how your antibiotics work and how your electrocautery and tools work are critical elements to the uh, residency training program. Uh, questions um, that I have is the, for the curriculum, for your didactics, as you said, there are a lot of new technologies coming out. Uh, how do you go back through and revise your curriculum each time for these new devices? Because we use now might not be the same thing yeah. we use in a month. Very great question. It, when you think about it, um, the hundreds and hundreds of hours of free time that we spend the $500,000 we uh, paid for the companies to do the MOC high stakes exam, which is not easy to do, the curriculum. I mean, we spent uh, over $500,000 on this. It's not cheap. Um, we are, we're in the process of revising the curriculum as we speak. So we are going to fix some of the things. We're going to add some slides, take some slides out. But it's, um, it's essentially a economic problem because the curriculum is not mandated. FES and FLS can do it because they, they are revenue neutral. Sages is not trying to make money with this. Let me tell you, neither of the programs makes money. We're trying to, we, we just need to find a way to make it economically viable. And that's one of the reasons why over the last few years you haven't seen, but finally now the Sages board has agreed to do a first revision. So we are very well aware that things are moving fast and that we have to stay on time. But the fundamental things that we talked about today are not gonna change. And we still are gonna use electro, radio frequency electrosurgical device for the foreseeable future in the majority of places, okay? Because there's also money involved buying the new devices. Why would you buy a new device if you, do, if you don't really understand why you should? It's a very good point, though. 
So from the get-go, the team that developed this was engineers, GYN, urologists, general surgeon, MIS surgeons, AORN. We had the president of AORN in our first. So when you look how many people, what's the percentage of people that take the FUSE exam? Half of them are nurses. So it's already very, we went to the AORN meeting twice and presented this, and they are actually much more likely to jump on this than surgeons, as you can imagine, right? We're the, as I said, we're, we're sort of, you know, silk has, you know, uh, cotton has worked for the last 100 years, you know, why shouldn't it work for the next 100 years, you know? We're, we're conservative, and that's good so. I'm not saying that's bad, but we're kind of reluctant to uh, advance it. So yes, your point is a very good one. This was developed with nurses in mind, with nurses at the table from the very get-go. Quick question, now. Say that again. So, so we dissect out the internal mammary artery off the chest, and, and we use coating. What? What are you afraid of when you do that? Are you afraid of injuring the vessel? Well, yeah, I would say you you at at the at the least you. So here's what I do. I don't use cut for everything. Blend and cut should be used for most everything. So you can try a blend mode. What you should do is use the low, the most important thing I teach is use the lowest setting that gives you the tissue effect you want. We just, 35, right? Everybody. Who doesn't use 35 to start with? Who, who uses, what do you use when you start? 15, that's right. So when you do a lap coli, start with 15. And if it works, it works great. Don't change it. Use your little uh, density thing trick. You know, use the tip, the side. Go up if it doesn't work. Go to 20. Go to 25. Most of the time, 25 will suffice. But most of us in the room are trained with 30, 35, 50, whatever it is. And that's what I'm trying to say. So in your case, I would. I don't mind if you use Coac, but just use it at, a, at the lowest possible setting that you get your tissue effect that you desire, and you reduce the risk of injuring it. Yes? Right. Great point. So, um, so here. You got two for Right. <laughs> and I. I was always worried. We, we worry, uh, and it's a, it's a valid concern, that the current uh, interferes with the programming. So, yeah, yeah. So it's not so much an issue with the with the large surface, but it's where it picks up the current, and it's not even the perforation. It's like that's very rare. But what you get, you get. Um, a, co a coagulation effect around the tip and all of a sudden you wonder why the battery only lasts one year instead of ten because there's a much higher insulation and it, it creates wrong signals and wrong and all that. 